Um, no, not well. When it's not measuring age rate, they seem to be measuring image angular velocity on the eye quite robustly independent of spatial texture. I didn't go into the detail, but you can certainly change the spatial frequency of these stripes on the wall. And you, you, that doesn't change it. So they're not measuring just you know, flicker uh, or the number of edges. No, this is not doing that. They're, they're measuring angular velocity of the eye, right, and integrating that over time quite independent of the spatial texture. Of course, when the texture has no motion cues, as in you know, blank wall, uh, or if you have axial stripes, then of course there's no motion. But as long as there are motion cues, it seems to be quite a robust system that measures angular velocity per se. And we've done this by varying spatial frequencies over a factor of four. We've also changed the contrast of the gradings, and I didn't have time to talk about all that. So up to about 20% uh, contrast, or down to about 20%, I should say, it's fairly robust. But when the contrast goes below it, it starts to drop. And more recently, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, we applied these over, over, over water bodies, over lakes. And when the, when the bee flies over a lake, the odometry reading drops again. It doesn't, doesn't rise as rapidly. So over land, it's fast, and over water, it's slow. And then when you hit land again, it goes up. So again, there you've got this. You know, it's not a true distance calibration. But you must keep in mind that bees have other backup strategies, too. I mean, they, they do use uh, snug cues, as we've seen. Uh, uh, quite often, I think it's a number of different sort of strategies that work. And um, it, doesn't, it wouldn't get them right down to the exact point. Uh, yeah, yeah. They would have to look around then. But also, also, I think uh, for very long distances, uh, I, I would imagine we would certainly pay attention to how exhausted is feeling. I mean, it's kind of crazy not to, <laughs> not to use that cue. But at least for small to moderate distances, it seems to be mainly visual and not uh, not empty. So we should board all our speakers. Copy break, yes. Cognitive constraints, coordination, dynamics. Mike Riley, I organized the symposium with Mike Riley, Cincinnati, Kevin Shockley. One slide, or actually two slides, uh, changes the program. On the uh, web, John Jacques Mercado was still listed as a speaker. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Uh, Paul Trevor and Mary Peter. Uh, uh, also, the order of the speakers is going to be slightly different than listed in the program. We're going to get started with uh, Mike Kirby, presenting uh, the work that uh, he and Jerry Valencia are doing at uh, Connecticut and University of Harvard, respectively. So, Mike uh, will speak on information reduction tests and the United States of Interland Coordination Dynamics. So, imagine a rather simple coordination requirement, oscillating two handheld pendulums in synchrony, but doing so while performing a simple mental activity, counting backwards in threes. So the question is, does this coordinated activity suffer from a cognitive task which is irrelevant to the coordinated, coordinated activity? And then we would like to know, certainly, how does it suffer, how does it change, and why should it change? The particular bimanual rhythmic activity we're looking at is often referred to as the elementary rhythmic synergy. It has been well studied, and I am afraid to say terribly well known. Here's its paradigmatic instance. Imagine a person oscillating the two hands in in-phase coordination. The symbol phi stands for relative phase. It is zero degrees or zero radians when the pattern is in phase. And here's the pattern when it is anti-phase. Here, in this case, phi is pi radians or 180 degrees. If a person is typically prepared to begin the activity in anti-phase and we speed the process up, then what one observes, again, in the traditional standard case is that the antiphase behavior becomes in phase spontaneously. If, in contrast, the person is prepared in in phase and the movement frequency is increased, then the pattern does not change. If we were to slow matters down, then in neither case is there a switch. Both stay in the in phase pattern. In order to capture this, some years ago, Harkin, Kelso, and Bookens suggested that we should represent this phenomenon by means of an energy landscape, a potential function. 
the symbol V stands for the potential. And the trigonometric expression on the y-axis is identifying the form of the potential well. It is negative in order to give us valleys separated by a small hill. Inside the valley, we identify the behavior of the coordination. The N stands for the noise that pushes this collective state of muscles and joints and neuromuscular apparatus in general, pushes it around. You notice that the well is deeper for the zero property of phi, the in phase, than it is for the anti phase. Now, if we take the negative derivative of oh, the do that, so let's go back. If we take the negative derivative of the potential function, then we get a motion equation. This is the Hark and Kelso Bunds motion equation with what we might refer to as a symmetric couple. But there's more to the story. The two hands, or any two rhythmic units that we might try to synchronize, are not always identical. And when there's a lack of identity, then what we can be prepared to expect is some sort of asymmetry. We need to capture the detuning, the fact that the two rhythmic moving, rhythmically moving units are not identical, that they contribute somewhat differently to the coordination. We need to capture that. And formalizations of the equation that take into account the detuning are such that they suggest that this term, the detuning, plus an extra kind of coupling will show up in the appropriate expression for this coordinated state. This was shown by Daffod Stoffer and company in 1998 and was suggested in experiments by Treffner and Turvey in 1995. It's this equation that we need to sort of consider as we try to understand does irrelevant cognitive activity affect coordination? If so, how? And if so, why? So our first charge is to ask how we might approach this equation. The pieces that are most relevant to producing the coordination itself are those that are not bounded by the purple. They are the pieces captured by the parameter delta omega and the parameters a and b. So we ask ourselves how to investigate. I wish you to imagine a 60 second trial in which the experimenter fixes delta omega and fixes the parameters A and B, and tells the subject which particular phase relationship to perform. We control delta omega in a rather simple way by using pendulums that have well-defined gravitationally preferred frequencies. And we can control the A B parameters by a metronome, which specifies movement frequency. Both theory and experiment show that the A B parameters are locked to move the fields. What should we expect of relative phase? That is to say, if we were to solve the equation minus the bits in purple, what should we expect? In this coordinate system, we want to see what happens when delta omega is zero. And movement frequency on the horizontal axis is changing. Imagine a trial in which you fix delta omega the difference between the two handheld pendulums, and you fix the metronome, the speed at which the activity should be conducted. If delta omega is zero, you'll see that the particular instances of A over B, or movement frequency, do not <coughs> move the coordination from in phase, which is the required pattern. But when delta omega is other than zero, in this case, the distinction is 0.5 hertz, meaning by convention, that the left oscillator is faster than the right, then you notice that the particular coordinated state elected by the equation, and subsequently, as we shall see, by the subject, is deviating from the infinite. If delta omega is negative, meaning that the left oscillator is slower, of lower frequency than the right, then you notice the pattern looks like this. What are these green points? What are they? These green points are the predicted trajectories of the stable collective states of the central nervous system. These are interesting equations, these. These are equations that are sort of more like 
more like formal calls than they are efficient and material causes. These are expressions of formal calls. Whatever are the material components and whatever are the efficient causes that underlie or are exhibited in these processes, they have to satisfy this kind of equation. So, what should we expect of the variability of those equations? Well, if we if we combine if we combine the equation that we're currently looking at with the procedure, the Fokker Planck procedure, which takes those potential wells and allows you to describe the probability distribution that goes with those potential wells, then this is the definition of the standard deviation of relative phase. There are two determining influences, Q, which is the perturbation or noise welling up from the interior pushing the collective variable around. And the other is lambda. And lambda is the steepness of these potential wells. It is a measure of the strength of the attractor. And one over lambda is the time it will take, essentially, to return to the bottom of the well following a small perturbation. Let's consider this part of our equation, the one that we're claiming is primarily responsible for coordination, for the pattern that we see. And what we need to do is to plot the rate of change of phi with respect to phi itself. And the two red spots are attractors. They are places to be. They are stable. You can hang out there. And the gray spot is not attractive. It's a repeller. The slope through the zero crossing gives us lambda. So we can ask of this equation, what does it expect of lambda? if we vary delta omega a and b. And this is what it expects. The equation expects the lambda will reduce with detuning. That is to say, the attractiveness of the pattern will get much less. And it also says that lambda will reduce with movement frequency. So we're looking at the part of the equation sort of dictating primarily how the pattern will behave given the need to move at a certain speed and with limbs that are either identical or not. The issue is how to measure these particular components. And this is not straightforward. So here are the two time series that we have, the right and left hand time series. And what we're trying to do is to take these two time series and employ the procedure of phase space reconstruction. So basically it means something like this. You take my two hands projected onto this screen, well, you'll notice that my thumbs can be regarded as neighbors. And they are still regarded as neighbors, if I do it right, if everyone can see, they're still neighbors, still neighbors, still neighbors. But the space in which this particular pattern is being generated is not two-dimensional, but three-dimensional. So I'm taking a three-dimensional structure, projecting it onto a two-dimensional screen, and there are neighbors <coughs> points. In terms of these two time series, as we overlap them, they have neighbors. The question is, are those neighbors real or false? Phase space reconstruction basically unpacks the space in which the dynamics responsible for the time series actually live. It's a technique that is slowly evolving, ideally maybe getting better for real data as opposed to mathematical statements. The goal is to take x, which is our one measure of displacement, and make time-delayed copies. <coughs> tau is the time delay. And I show you only three, but typically there would be more than three for this particular issue. And here are the two time series now living in, ideally, the space that generated, the space in which they came from. Given this, we can then introduce the method of cross-recurrence analysis. What does this do? It gives us certain quantities. There's a quantity which is the percentage of points shared by the two time series in this space space. This quantity, percent recurrence, we can use as an indicator of Q, of noise. The fewer points shared, the more noisy is the data under observation. And we can use this quantity. That is to say, if these neighbors are protracted, then this is an indicator of how stuck together they are, the strength of the attractor governing the two time series. 
This is referred to as max line, and we can use this as our indicator of the land. So, here's a subject in the experiment. Let's look at the data. I wish you to imagine again there are conditions of detuning and requirements to move at certain speeds. If coordination is all the person is doing, then these are the data as the equation predicts. In many respects, I think this is a remarkable outcome. Personally, I find it much more tantalizing, deeper than the Fitz law. I think this is much more interesting. What happens when you ask the person now to perform a mental activity at the same time? Well, this mental activity does the following. It moves those stable coordinations away from where they were when the coordination was occurring in, as it were, isolation. Coordination shifts the attractors of bimanual coordination. What's cognition's effect on lambda and q? Well, cognition, coordination alone, I should say, produces this pattern for max line. This is the max line data which is what we would have expected if Max Line is <coughs> picking off something like lambda, the attractiveness, the strength of the attractor, how attractive is it? And with respect to percent recurrence, our measure of Q, this is what the data look like. Now you notice we have delta omega 0, 0.5 and minus 0.5. The equation would like 0.5 and minus 0.5 to be identical, but you can see they're not quite matters whether the higher oscillator is in the left hand or the right hand. That's the story in its own right. What happens when we add to these conditions of coordination, of coordination, we add cognition? Now you notice that uh, max line is uh, affected by detuning and by frequency. Q, our estimate of Q, percent recurrence, is affected only by detuning. There is no frequency component. Such had been surmised by Scherner and company some years ago. The Q term for a given detuning remains fixed. The amount of noise welling up from the interior pushing the coordination around is fixed very much by detuning and unaffected by moving trees. Under cognition, it turns out that there are no significant differences in max line. That is to say, the strength of the attractor did not change under the cognitive manipulation. But percent recurrence, our index of noise, our index of Q, is reduced. There are fewer shared points in the phase space that we have constructed. The noise factor has gone up. We can summarize this rather simply. This is what we did. We took coordination dynamics represented by those equations. We had the equation representing the state of affairs of relative phase in terms of what values it assumes, and then we have the equation telling us about its fluctuations, its variability. And we have the participant busily performing a cognitive task while engaged in rhythmic movement. What did cognitive activity do? It did this. It shifted feed. It increased Q. And it did not change lambda. These are the results of the experiments. This is what we can suppose is a reasonable beginning. How should we understand this shift in relative phase, the moving of the attractive state? Think about it. The attractive state, in terms of potential well, was shifted by cognitive activity. But this did not happen. The well did not open up such that a perturbation would force the movement of the coordination over a greater range larger standard deviation, if you will. It stayed like this. But the noise inside was increased. How should we understand such an outcome? So now let's look at the form, Daffel, Stoffer, Treffner, Turvey equation, whatever we wish to call this. Let's see what happens to C and D. This is now by way of suggestion, by way of hypothesis. I think we have to assume that C and D parameters are somehow locked into attentiveness. In fact, empirically, this was shown in 1996 by Amazine et al. That the C D parameters encode, as it were, the attentiveness required by the detuning. The more difficult the coordination to use standard psychological language, the more attention perhaps has to be dictated, has to be dedicated, to speak more appropriately, to the coordination. <coughs> 
what happens when we add cognition? Focus upon the purple because we've done nothing to what's in the red. We did not change delta omega. We have not changed A and B. Let us suppose that all that's changing is the asymmetric <coughs> coupling term somehow is absorbing whatever we mean by attentiveness. There's shared attention now. And C has reduced. C prime is less than C. D prime is less than B. Simulations show that this manipulation produces exactly the phase shift with no change in lambda. That is to say, it takes the attractor and it moves it, but does not open it up. In order to open the attractor up, you have to really be playing with delta omega A and B. Take attention, share attention, let cognition require some of it, and the coordination moves, but does not open up. So we can answer, I think, reasonably, at least as a first pass, the questions with which we can. How does cognition affect coordination dynamics? What is a kind of parameter modulation? Perhaps some of our challenges with understanding this very loose notion of capacity limitations, the sharing of capacity, a very fundamental idea in psychological theory. This particular notion may be, perhaps, slowly addressable through the tools of coordination dynamics and nonlinear measures, perhaps. Cognition affects coordination, coordination dynamics by reducing the parameters and increasing Q. Why should it do so? In a nonlinear process, in a self-organized system, all parts are connected to all parts. There is generic interconnectedness. There is implicit correlation with the law. We should always expect that anything that goes on in one place feeds its mark at every other place. We just need the tools to be able to see that, to see this hallmark characteristic of self-ordering system. closer to what's required goes up. So it means that there are conditions that can move the attractor in directions away from the desired state and closer to it. So now, do we have here an opportunity to look at the classic discussions of uh, how motivation, first of all, increases performance up to a certain level, famous inverted U function in psychology, and then shows a decrease in performance as motivation increases. We, we always know that you need some high degree of attentiveness, intensity directed to an activity to do well, but we also know that too much makes us do poorly. So do we have here, in these kinds of ways of looking at a phenomenon, and, uh, a means, a procedure for beginning to understand these classical curves in learning and motivation of literature, the inverted U? I think possibly so. I mean, these simple experiments allow us to, I think, make such inquiry possible. We, we, we really need to move on now. We do have some time at the end of the session for questions. We have 10 minutes after all the speakers have finished, so if you have a question, uh, we'll get to it then. Our next speaker is uh, Paul Treffer. He's uh, presenting work of uh, uh, for other here. Uh, we'll talk his attention to the dynamics of speech and coordination. Follow on what Mike Turley has been presenting with regard to cognition and dynamics. We have explicitly been exploring the correlation between not two limbs of the same girl, 
but different effectors. In particular, we've been looking at speech hand coordination. So our initial experiments almost 10 years ago, <coughs> begun 10 years ago and published somewhat later, uh, were with regard to pendulum swinging. Let's now up the ante and explore cognition, paradigmatic, paradigmatic. Classical example of cognition is language. <laughs> language under stress gets interrupted. So we're looking at speech hand coordination. Here's the paradigm. Under a metronome such as Mike, please. I can synchronize and I can make speech at the same time. Ba, 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 ba. Or I can do the anti phase. Ba, 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 ba. Give me a faster, please, master. <laughs> Synchronization. That's the classical transition from anti phase to in phase. <coughs> that is what synergetics is all about. It's the concept of an order parameter, a pattern parameter, such as the relative phase, such as the relative timing, switching to another pattern which turns out to be more stable. In Mike's diagrammatic visualization, more stable versus less stable in terms of the shallowness of the potential well. This is the potential well. Once again, to remind you, the classical example here is of the hacking Kelsey Boons with the Dafferstoffer Treffner Turvey um, elaboration. Um, classical physics has shown that this can be derived experimentally. We showed that this captures the asymmetries of performance. This is the stable and the unstable, and the classical transition happens as the frequency of coordination increases. We go from red, blue, and so forth to a different potential well. So we have a little unstable ball <coughs> falling into the stable well. That's the classical transition from anti-phase, 180 degrees, to in-phase, 0 or 360 degrees. Okay, so that's a big picture. So our experimental paradigm is we looked at right-handers and left-handers. We're interested in laterality. Classical example of cognition is handedness and brain laterality. So we're looking at both groups, right and left-handers, we've explained and we measured the behavior. <coughs> we looked at in-phase and anti-phase, preparing the subject in the in-phase or preparing in the anti-phase and increasing frequency in a number of plateaus, somewhat like what Mike just demonstrated. We use left and right hands and we look at the hand being synchronized with the metronome versus the speech being synchronized. This is basically the data that we get at the start of an anti-phase trial. Here's the speech and the amplitude envelope of the speech signal. And here is the kinematic data, simply the amplitude position of the red jaw and the blue finger. And you can see the anti-phase pattern, which switches into the in-phase pattern. And you can see the, the bottom of the blue is the finger down, and the bottom of the red is the jaw open. Ba, ba, ba. To remind you of relative phase calculations, if this is the red jaw and the blue finger, here we have a situation close to 180 degrees, but we call this as the jaw is leading the finger by 130 degrees. Our numbers are less than 180. Conversely, we'd say the finger lags by 230. But we're going to focus on leads that are less than 180. In this case, the difference relative phase is actually 50. 130 is 50 degrees away from 180. So we will also talk about the difference relative phase, like an error signal, an error measure, I should say, absolutely. Here's another example of the anti-phase trajectories on the kinematics and the relative phase time series switching into in-phase from around 180 to in-phase. Here, the average is about minus 10 degrees, which means the finger is leading. In the difference relative phase, or even just the normal relative phase for in-phase, minus 10 means the finger is slightly ahead, like this. Back, back, back. I'm exaggerating, not actually very close. That, 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 that's actually minus 10. Most people lead with the finger in infants. Look at the subtlety and complexity of the results. For right-handers, we do not get a simple peak, but we do get a distribution of results with a mean of minus 25 degrees, which means the finger is leading. For left-handers, minus 24 degrees, remarkably similar. For anti-phase, 
the results are spread out much more. For right-handers, math that is the mean is plus 47. Plus 47 here averaged across all numbers. You will notice the, the uh, minus and plus is being averaged, but plus 47 is the overall average. For left-handers, an even greater distribution, much more uh, complexity, you might say, than the results for left-handers in anti-phase. And this is the pre-transition data only for the anti-phase trials. We're only going to focus on the pre-transition data. Overall result is this. Right-handers and left-handers, the difference in relative phase, so that we can now compare in-phase with anti-phase. And we see, importantly here, that the pattern influences the right hand only. Is this significant? This is significant. The right hand or left hemisphere is the same influence in both right-handers and left-handers. Furthermore, there is also a difference between the hands for in-phase only. For anti-phase, sorry, for the left hand, there's no difference between pattern. Only in the right hand is a difference between pattern. And there's a difference between the hands for in-phase. These points are no difference from zero for the left. But for the right hand, the, shift, the pattern is having an influence on the right hand. Again, left hemisphere. Pattern affects the right hand only, hand matters, handedness does not in this dual task cognitive coordination. <coughs> More interesting, let's look at the effect of frequency on the finger lead in the left hand and the right hand of right handers for the infiz condition. We see that there's a shift, as Mike was saying, there's a shift as frequency increases. And the shift is going increasingly towards perfect infants. But you notice the shift is even bigger for the right hand and the left. Here is the standard deviation, the variability, as frequency increases. Look at this. The standard deviation gets less. The variability gets less. The peakiness of the potential well is going from that to that as frequency goes up. The classical HKB symmetrical case predicts the opposite. The variability goes up with frequency. We get it with less. So similar to the results of the person I'm replacing today, Tim Prado uh, from France, and his reaction time coordination dynamics experiments. For left-handers, similar story. Here there's a transition even from the finger lead to a slight jaw, the positive. And uh, on the right hand, definitely finger lead. Again, a decreasing, decreasing standard deviation. For anti-phase, very interestingly, we get a transition from a jaw lead to a finger lead. By jaw lead, in 180, I mean this. Bap, 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 bap. As opposed to a finger lead, which would be like this. Bap, bap, bap. You get the difference? Good. <laughs> Weird. Um, so, so the, the jaw, the, the, the attention, the coordination, has primarily a jaw lead in anti-phase. But at high frequencies, this tends to switch over. That's what Bala says. Again, a decreasing, even perhaps even a U-shaped function, right? The previous discussion was about performance uh, having an optimality. Most of our standard deviations are decreasing, but here we actually maybe could infer some sort of capital uh, income. And for left-handers, Similar story in the right hand as for the left handers. Sorry, for the, the right handers. Okay, here's the right hand in the right hand. Here's the left hand in the right hand. What's really kind of strange is the left hand in the left handers. All finger lead, whereas we would somewhat <coughs> draw the primarily in, in similar to the right hand. But in the left handers, finger lead. But a similar standard deviation story. So there's the um, schematic of the situation. For in phase, undershooting of zero, a finger lead. For anti phase, going from a jaw lead to a finger lead, perhaps with a crossover. I'm very busy doing that. What's remarkable is that this point of minimum departure seems to correspond with the minima of the variability curves. Okay, you look at what I'm saying. Ignore the left hand of anti phase. Left-handers. Okay, so we've got this sort of data thing happening that would be extended. Uh, here, in phase left-handers. Uh, 
Okay, so if this is the case, I mean, obvious. Let's go back to our typical HKB, but now we're going to explore this asymmetrical component. Here in red is the potential wealth you know quite well intuitively, and here is the velocity, the rate of change of the pattern parameter. It's nice to think about this per pattern parameter as the kinematics of pattern. Velocity is normally in terms of displacement in physics, when we talk about kinematics of position and displacement. Here, what we're doing is the kinematics of pattern. The order parameter is a relational variable captured the relative phase. We're looking at now the kinematics of pattern. That's what these dynamical systems diagrams show. And this is the attractor. The negative slope, we have an attractor here and here. Phase velocity is zero. There's minimal change from this point at this point. When it's perturbed, the relative phase, you get sucked back. When it's perturbed positively, you get pulled back. These are attractors. So, looking at the velocity curve, what we're seeing here are one, two, three, four, five curves for five different frequencies, from low, red, to high frequency. This is where delta omega, there's no difference in the frequency being modeled between the jaw and the finger. And we see the classical example of the, the gradient getting less and less, so the attractiveness getting less and less. The strength of the stability of the pattern is less and less as frequency goes up. In fact, there's no stability here. You lose the anti-phase pattern of the green. This is importantly modeled unrealistically with no biomechanical difference. Now we have a realistic biomechanical difference of minus four to model the difference between the jaw frequency and the finger. In this case, the patterns are all shifted basically downwards, which tends to pull <coughs> dramatically the attractors to the left, to the left. The whole system is were pulled down to the minus number being added numerically here in simple uh, terms. Okay. But this is not the data. This is not what the data is saying. We now address this attentional parameter. So previous work, um, working with uh, Michael Riley back in 97, and the Amazons carried this tradition of exploring what happens now if you do experiments where attention is explicitly controlled. It turns out the data can be captured by the D parameter in the full asymmetric, uh, asymmetric equation. If D is added, we now find that as we go from uh, low to high frequency, um, we're still having a problem with the slopes getting less and less. Remember, the data is showing decrease in, st decrease in uh, uh, variability <coughs> and increase in stability. But this model is showing the opposite. It's showing a decrease in stability. That's the opposite of what we want. But the attention is shifting the attractors in the right direction that we want. So let's carry on the model. Let's now increase the attention. If this parameter is stepped from frequency to frequency and increased by minus 6, minus 12, and so forth, we get a requisite increase in the slopes of the slope curve. So the attractor is getting stronger. That will capture the variability going down, as we saw in the data. But the attractors are not in the right place. We want them to be in this region for 180 and in this region for 0. Let's go back to the data and plot the absolute relative phase <coughs> for in phase, 52. For in phase, left hand, around 50. Anti phase, around 50 away from 180. For anti phase, left hand, around 150 away from 80. There is a shift of 50 degrees. If we add now an offset of 50 degrees to the equation, it shifts the attractors to undershooting 180 and to undershooting zero. This is almost the data. From the data, we insert the 50 degrees offset, and we now replicate the data. We get increasing slope, which means decreasing, the decreasing um, variability, increasing stability, and we get undershoot of 180 and undershoot of zero. It's not quite perfect, though. It's not exactly what the data might um, what you're going to see in terms of replicating what you have empirically discovered. This, however, does. The C parameter has not been motivated previously. The C parameter has been added because these are the next two terms in the Fourier expansion of a wiggly line. That's basically why these parameters exist. D, we've been able to motivate empirically with attentional experiments. 
If we now explore the attentional part, the asymmetry block by the C, and increase that, what it does is to visualize this, it's as if I pull these curves up, uh, down, and pull these curves, let me get that right, pull these curves up, and so we can pinch these here, pull them up. Okay, pinch these, pull them up, pinch these, pull them down. Pull those up, it's going to bring that through. Pull that down, it's going to bring those back. That's what the C does. It, it's an asymmetry in opposite directions. Weird, but it actually replicates the data in this. There. So we go from there, where there's no carrying through in 180, to there where there's overshoot, and it magnifies the undershoot of zero by magnifying. And that, in fact, was what the data showed. It showed dramatic undershoot for in phase, in relief, and it showed moving from undershooting 180 to overshooting 180 with a decrease in the variability. So the summary is the serial order, the sequencing of the finger lead or jaw lead in the right, is on the right hand, emphasis for the left hemisphere in this minimal speech task. There's an attentional asymmetry that must be increased, that's your D parameter, to keep the coordinate. So we can address cognitive so-called phenomena. The sinker is addressed through this 50 degrees P sector, sometimes referred to, perceptual sector, or um, perceptual offset, which has implications for the notion of timing and simultaneity. Importantly, this dynamical system approach shows that one can take a lawful approach to the evolution of patterns. And where we'd like to think this is leading to is that semantics is not a symbolic only thing. Semantics is, as we now say everywhere, embodied. <coughs> rate of production matters. So the rate at which one is communicating, perhaps through multimodal methods, through multiple effectors, is going to change the timing between them. The question is, does that underlie the subtleties of communication? Does that underlie the subtleties of getting your point across as to whether your timing is like that or like that? And so forth. I thank you for your attention. Um, left hand is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, some people are perfectly lateralized. Um, uh, I noticed in your talk it involves not only the motor coordination but the language coordination. Have you made any attempt to separate out left handers who are perfect left handers and those who are uh, left handers but lateralized and all the language? We did indeed. Uh, following from uh, pivotal work discovering that distinction by Michael Peters, and this goes back to the 95. Um, experimental results that we published, we looked at consistent and inconsistent left-handers, consistent being those who, it turns out, can throw a ball and kick a ball with their left foot. Inconsistent left-handers tend to make those coarse motor movements of kicking a ball and throwing a ball with their right foot, and they make a statistically significant population. So we did categorize our left-handers, we did have sub subgroups there, and um, the result is escaping me and also by no difference. No difference. Both um, consistent and inconsistent like left handers show the same pattern of results. Any attempt to look at language lateralization per se? Language lateralization? Is that what you asked? Yeah, we have not attempted no, to do any uh, assume that uh, <coughs> the distribution is going to be just like the general population or 90% is going to have language in that case here. Right, uh, we need to move on again. We have uh, some time after the uh, last speaker. So. Our next speaker is uh, Miguel Moreno from the Much of what we know about uh, word recognition comes from experiments where uh, a letter string appears on the computer screen and the experimenter measures the time required to make a response. In a lexical decision task, for example, words and non-words appear in random order. Now, uh, I think I need to explain for this group that a non-word is a letter string that just does not spell a word. I feel kind of odd as a word you're speaking to a logical psychologist, so you'll pardon me if uh, I use a lot of these terms that are 